So yeah. Yeah. maybe you want to talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, because I feel like what he line. wants is he, he works at the World Bank, and my father worked at the IMF, and I witnessed this firsthand, that their ring, their offices are ringed with protesters on an almost daily basis. Uh, they would have to sometimes, like he, my dad would wear like jeans and a t-shirt to try and get in so that he could blend in. But these guys did not blend in, they had their jeans like, first of all the t-shirts tucked into the jeans, <laughs> the jeans are like right up under their boobs, you're like, what, this is not, you know, no one's going to buy it. Yeah, the t-shirt like a peace sign on it. Exactly. Tie dye right? Yeah. They're like, I am one of you. You're like, you look like a fucking middle-aged economist, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> So, but there was a way in which um, it seemed, I think Vincenzo, the character in this book, he admires, he's very lonely, I mean his wife has died recently, and he admires the sort of sense of community that he sees there, and he wonders if the sense of community is what is most appealing to those protests, to the protesters, uh, rather than their, I mean they have ideas that they believe in. And I had this other experience with my father, and I think it's a sort of a common experience for W, what we call ourselves WBGK, it's a like World Bank group of kids. And we all, most of us disagreed with the work that our parents were doing on political backgrounds. We would be outside protesting. And then you go in for a veggie burger in the middle of the day, uh, you know, past the security. And then you'd argue with your parents about their work. And of course they have a PhD in economics and they've been working in that place for 20 years. And they know the ins and outs of all of these issues. And so you're so ill-equipped for this conversation. You know, you may have your patchouli smell and you're like, ah, I have my opinion, this is wrong. And, and they're just like, they're not they sort of gets the chance to yeah. do that, I care. There's a way, it was a very complicated thing. You, you end up respecting the complexity of the issue because you can't win the arguments easily. And I ended up studying economics and writing as a liberal for a right-wing think tank. I was their token liberal. And I got an experience to sort of, you really are forced to look at both sides of these issues. And in economics, most issues are quite complicated. But, so I feel like Vincenzo is adamantly agnostic on many of these things because he acknowledges the sort of futility of trying to have a firm opinion. And then you must have an opinion of some sort. You must, otherwise you're just gonna sit there in paralysis. Um, and so he's faced with these problems and he, is these constantly being courted by the left and the right, being sort of asked to sort of become a member of the group, uh, and he finds the confines sort of unacceptable. But it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of about decision making in that way. I think the book is very concerned with that. Um, well, it's similar to what I was just reading with the um, woman who sort of, right. with her friends, she sort of wants to offend her parents, and then with her parents, she. Yeah, I feel like it's a trick of writing political fiction, you know, uh, or work, there's obviously quite a lot of it in your writing as well, um, of people, you have to sort of rehabilitate the monster. I think I was thinking about this with um, Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, during it, after his death, there were all those uh, articles about him and interviews with him, and they were, he was talking about how he plays all these monsters, uh, these terrible, terrible people, and it's not that his job is to make them likable or say what they're doing is okay, like this is a pedophile, that's okay. It's like, no, he's not saying that. Nonetheless, if he does his job well, he has to allow for their full humanity. Mm. Um, and I, I, I see that in your writing too, I wonder if you are concerned with that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, um, it's like one of the most important things you can do as a writer in fiction, and it's like, well, I feel like what makes fiction a really like exciting thing, an exciting thing to write and read is that it's like, it, it demands this certain level of empathy in the sense that that other things in life don't don't demand it, I think, because you have to, you have to like take someone and really imagine, really try and figure out what why they're making the choices they're making and what it's like to be them. And, right. and you have to take people sometimes who make choices you don't like or do things you don't like and sort of, sort of really try to figure out you know, how they got there. Yeah. Um, and, and that takes a lot of generosity, I think. And I, and I think the yeah. best fiction, you know, has that. And that, and the, and the, fiction, the, the worst fiction right. doesn't have that. Like, I always find, you know, the stuff I don't like, I find it's almost like the writer is sort of condescending to the characters or right. something. That there's some sense of the writer being, you know, looking down on the characters. 
We were also talking about unlikable characters. I mean, like we were talking about that story of yours, December Boys Got a Bad, in which the guys worked for Lehman Brothers the day they lose their job. So and it's amazingly funny and dark as all get out. It's a really wonderful story, but I was, I was wondering, like, the unlikability question. Like, obviously, people, as I was saying earlier, the sort of, like, the feeling of escape. They're, mm -hmm. like, want, even in a, the most serious literary novels, a lot of them are historical fiction, or there's a sort of magical realist element. Like, I love Jonathan Lethem or something, but there's a kind of improbable quality to, you know, to a lot of the stuff, or Taya Obrecht, is I'm a big fan of hers, but there's a sort of, there's a kind of fabulous element and a lot of historical fiction, like the books that win the big awards are often historical fiction. And it may be about some incredibly bleak passage of human existence, but people are still wearing fedoras and smoking cigarettes, and there's a kind of, you know, a nice tinge to things, a sort of sepia tinge. But I wonder about this unlikability, the harshness of that, and how you, because your books, are, your writing is incredibly entertaining, and how you get around the sort of repellent quality of some of the people, I guess. Well, I think that's that's the challenge, right? Is to sort of is to write a character. I don't know. Yeah, is to make them compelling. Really, right. I mean that's the important thing. And I think you know, especially for me, like like humor. I feel like humor can go a long way that's towards true. that in terms of. But yeah, I don't think people necessarily need to like a character so much as they just want to spend time with them. Like right. there are people in my own life who I don't really like that much. Yeah, yeah. But like I really like sitting next to them in a bar for an hour while they like say some crazy ass shit. Right. You know? Yeah. And sometimes it's sort of like that with your fictional characters. Like you don't necessarily it's not the person you you necessarily want to be best friends with, but someone who can like tell you a good story, who can right. you know, who can make you laugh, who can make you kind of interested, who can present things in an interesting way. Um, <coughs> you rethink things. Yeah, and, yeah that makes sense. and you know, I don't know. People, I've often been tagged with this unlikable character thing, which I, I find it really hurtful because I really like all the characters. <laughs> and then sometimes I'm like, that character was just kind of me. me. Yeah, no, but yeah, like, yeah, you know, and horrible. it's like, why don't you like me? <laughs> you know, I, but you know, it's a hard. Th I had a, it was a really hard thing for me to deal with my first book because a lot of people, you know, found the character. Unlikable, and I kept thinking, like, but he's so sweet. And they were like, but why doesn't he like get a job? I'm like, you don't understand. He like doesn't really even know how he would like, go about that. He's like so confused. Like he just needs a hug. And they're like, like, I don't like this. So funny. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I think people want to be want to be yeah want to be entertained. You want to be compelled. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And. And yeah, I think especially sometimes, you know, it's like this challenge I find sometimes. Like I found out with the Wall Street story. So I wrote this story about these two Wall Street bankers who they lose their jobs and they decide they're gonna go to American Apparel and, and get dressed up as hipsters and then like go to bars in Brooklyn to try to pick up girls. Um, and they somehow succeed, or the friend succeeds, sure. and the narrator just gets sadder. Um, <laughs> he has a girl who's his partner, yeah, him, but she's yeah. like, I'm not going to sleep with you. Yeah, she's, yeah, the friend goes <laughs> off with one, the other girl's just like, yeah, no, we're just going to sit here. We're going to sit here and listen. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it was a kind of, like, I felt like that was almost the challenge, is like, everyone hates bankers, especially right now. Like, I hate bankers. Right. Like, like, I'm going to, like, these Occupy Wall Street protests and stuff, but, like, like what about you know who is this guy and right. why and that's sort of John. It's like let's see who this like how did this guy end up being this person that everyone hates right. and like was it even really his like what you know he just sort of maybe ended up in that position without. without well, there's a moment Lawrence the guy who's there's two of these bankers one is quite nicer he's the, the narrator is quite he's not that bad he's a pretty pleasant person in a lot of ways but Lawrence is like brash and like yeah. obscene sort of more than sort of kind of racist. He's like really atrocious. And he's also, you can't turn away. Like you're sort of, you have to watch him because he's very- Yeah, the uh, narrator can't quite turn away. Yeah, as well, yeah. But there's a moment where he like, what, he goes to a museum and he bursts out crying at the side. Oh yeah, at a Rothko. <laughs> he's looking at a Rothko and he starts crying. And yeah. There's a kind of, it's a character though where you're like, this person is, for all of his insanity and horribleness, there's a kind of, even yeah, with someone like him, there's a kind human. of tenderness. Yeah. I, mean, I think also, you know, I, I t I'm teaching a class on humor writing right now, so I'm still writing okay. about it. But 
you want, I feel like that's like you want to surprise your reader. You want your character, you don't want your characters to know what, you don't want your reader to know what the character is going to say next. Right. And so like if you have this character who's like this sleazy banker, like, it might be kind of like no one expects him to cry at a Rothko or something, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I don't know, it's kind, of, it's kind of fun. But I think there's this kind of fun challenge of like, let's take someone who people think just like off the bat will assume is really appalling and like, and like make them somehow likable and make, right. them, and make by the end of the story you're like, I get it, I get like yeah. how this person ended up here, even if I don't sort of yeah. think they made very smart decisions sometimes. Yeah, I just read this enormous book by uh, Bob Shikotis, the, <coughs> one, uh, the Woman Who Lost Her Soul, and it's long. But the woman in question at the beginning is very f sort of a flat character. She's very <coughs> unlikable and horrible. And she seems like a cliche, like a woman using sex to accomplish goals. And there's all these kind of unpleasant, misogynistic overtones to the book initially. And I was initially kind of like horrified. And then the book goes on for another 800 pages. And at some point, she becomes wildly complicated. She has multiple aliases, an incredibly complex backstory. And by the end, you see her. It's sort of like, and I think Lolita kind of does that with Humber as well, where he, mm -hmm. where he does it in the reverse in a way. He sort of tricks you into liking him and then pulls Is it first person? Lolita is... No, this book. No, it's Sorry, multiple. It's interesting. I actually have had this problem with, because my first novel, I write a lot in first person. You're mm -hmm. pretty much all third. For now, yeah. Um, which is interesting. Um, one of the things I've always sort of, I think is hard about the like my first novel is written in the first person, and and you know it's by this the narrator is quite unreliable sort of. Right. Um, he he is as a person who doesn't he's so sort of caught up in his own sadness that I think he like doesn't quite realize that other people exist in a way, and he lives with his mother. But like I don't think he's ever thought like I wonder what my mother feels right. or thinks. Um, and so I wanted to have this character, I, I felt like it was like very, you know, the, the character had to be this way because, because he, um, he, he was, he's a, he's a person who's, who's just very confused and, and sort of hasn't quite figured out how to, to communicate with other people. Right. Um, but, you know, but then at the same time, I didn't want the book to, to feel like all the other characters were flat. Right. It's like, how, how do you sort of figure out how to have this character who's, Whose worldview, um, is you know, is world. flat, but and yet have other characters <coughs> that are That's sort really of interesting challenge. alive. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want the other characters to be flat, but like he doesn't, he sees them as flat, sort of. But and, yeah. and I think the way I figured out was just like, we just have the other characters speak, right, <laughs> and say and things. Say things. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like even if you have <coughs> a character who's sort of, you know, who's who's trying to tell you their version of the story, right. Um, there are ways, as a writer, you can figure out to, to, to you know let the reader know that there's That's another reader of that story, yeah. and, that, and that you, as the author, are not you know you're not the character in the way that right. that you can see things they can't. I, I think that's a hard thing. Even in third person, I find that there's a I'm not the narrator. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the author. I'm not the narrator, and that is a confusing boundary for a lot of readers. They assume that because the narrator in this book there was a part of it, uh, a version of it where the narrator channeling the character. I mean, it's close third person, so the narrator sort of, <coughs> even the voice of the book is a little bit higher than I would normally write. Mm -hmm. So it's not my voice in a way, it's, uh, it's infected with Vincenzo's erudition. Um, and it was a version of where he was com sort of complaining about feminism. And I wrote it because that would be the, but the narrator's writing this, you right. know? And I was like, I, people are going to get upset because they're going to think this is my belief, but it's filtered through the consciousness yeah, of this character. It's a thing for people to. It's, yeah, it's a tricky thing as a writer to deal with. And, and yet I love writing in close third in that way. To be, because it gives you some leverage as well. I can sort of move away from the character when I want to. But, but I find increasingly that I'm getting closer and closer trapped into my character's minds. And so the book I'm writing now, I find myself in first person, and that's... I, guess I, to, I think that's maybe a good segue. I wanted to ask you about about who this character, Vincenzo, is to you, and how you sort of... Because so both your books, um, in the first one, it's sort of 
What's your concern about these guys who kind of <coughs> work in the financial world and are sort of caught between these two places right. um, where on the one hand they sort of they sort of want to make money and have right. the certain kind of lives and, and and on the other hand they sort of hate what they're doing and don't quite believe in right. it. And I, I guess I just wondered and, and, and you know and, and one of the really interesting things is both both um, both books center around the same set of events, which is right. the sort of political situation in Bolivia in two thousand five. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just sort of wondering like who those characters are to you and like what you know yeah. not and and like how you ended up choosing those two guys to be the I was initially writing the books at the same time and they were one book interweaving stories but um they ultimately didn't belong together because um they were about different things fundamentally uh it was fun but it didn't work so I cleaved them in half and I was like yeah I have two books now that's very nice for me uh and uh <clears throat> and the first book I finished first. I left this one sort of on a shelf somewhere for a while. But um, and I think there's not a shelf. No, no, no. How no. many people always talk about them? The shelf. <laughs> no, yeah. Like a drawer. It's like I don't have any drawers. No. no. <laughs> um, but they, yeah. In a way, I mean, to be perfectly honest, the first book, the character's a version of me. You know, he's like a guy who was like, what would have happened to me if I had remained in the world of I worked briefly in sort of finance and stuff for a year or two before I felt really dirty and left. Uh, but what would have happened if I had stayed with that and become more and more successful in it? Um, and so he represents a kind of, you know, just a story of ambition in a certain way, um, male ambition in particular. Uh, and this guy, frankly, is sort of a version of my father, uh, who's this erudite, bookish economist at the IMF in reality uh, for many years, who was a sort of amateur Dante scholar who loved to play chess. And I gave those attributes to the character and my dad had always read everything that I wrote, and I finished this book, and, uh, he, and it was, he knew it was going to be published in a few months, and he said, like, hello, can I read this thing? What's going on? And I said, uh, uh, no, no, no. And I finally said, all right, all right, I'm going to let you read it. I'm going to let you read it. But it's dedicated to you, first of all, so that's nice. <laughs> but if it's not nice, you might start freaking out, because he'd freaked out before when I read an essay, which I mentioned just briefly, that he bought me a, a crappy suit once. Uh, and he was very well, upset. He was very embarrassed or something. I was like, so he's going to be mortified. Like this is an entire book in which there's a lot of you on the page. So I hope you don't hate me. Um, I was so petrified. I remember he was reading in this chair. And I was like sitting up, and he read it in a single day. Just sat there reading it, and I was just my life was exploding around me as well at the same time. And he read the book, and I was like. Put it down into the afternoon and I said, What did you think? And he said, Oh, it's very beautiful. I like it. It's better than the first book. And then he burst out crying. Oh, and I was like, Oh my God. Um, so that was, it was intense. It was, he, was, he was a big fan. I was very excited. But then what happened uh, was that a month after he read it, about a month after he read it, he had a massive stroke. And he's now, he's fine. He's recovering. So you killed him. I killed him. <laughs> no, he had the stroke, and he, he's, he's been a couple months in the hospital, and now he's out of the hospital, and he's recovering slowly. But basically, his mind is coming back in many ways. He's, he can write. He's now ambidextrous. Well, I mean, that's weird. Uh, and he can write perfectly well. He came in one morning in the hospital in Scotland, and he had written out a Shakespearean sonnet from memory. And I was like, wow, that was very impressive. Uh, but he can't read. The part of the brain that processes reading is completely separate from the part that does writing. So he can write words and he won't be able to read them. But it turns out that this was the last novel that he oh, read yeah. before he permanently lost his. It's like, I hope you like it. <laughs> That's yeah. terrible. Like, everything about it. I don't really know what I'm supposed to say now. Just no, saying, you're fine. We're going to open up the My game. mom called me and said, Mazel Tov. It is a hard thing to show you. My, uh, we were talking about this this before, but my, my dad's a writer, and, and uh, so for years I um, wanted to read his books, some sort of... You read them? Uh, yeah, I read them. I, I was really scared to. It took me a long time to read them, um, because I didn't sort of want to know what... It's like a novel, reading a novel is a very intimate experience. Even if you're, you know, even the, two of his books are historical novels, but it still feels really... You like, see all sorts of... Yeah, and... Um, 
I don't want to know. Like, I don't want to know, like, how he, like, imagines, like, a sex scene. You know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, I had to put up with that. So then when I became a writer, I was sort of, like, payback time. Sure. Your um, writing is obscene. Yeah. You must be horrified. Um, well, no. They, they They're cool. cool. They're pretty yeah, cool. right. minded I, um, when I, I didn't, I went to graduate school, I did an MFA, and, um, on the last, at, at graduation, instead of like a graduation, they have, everyone gives a reading for two minutes. That's nice. And all the parents come, my parents were there, and um, for some reason I um, decided to read the story, which is actually the last story in this book, um, about this couple who used a live lobster as a sex toy. <laughs> and, and my parents were there, and they were, my mom came up to me after, and she said, you were the dirtiest and the best. <laughs> but, but then the hardest thing I realized is, is actually, my parents were right, but reading to my, I, I had this experience when my first book came out, and we were reading at the book party, and you know, a lot of people there, um, it was like the opening night, and I'm reading, and I was like, you know, it's my book party, like, I'm gonna read the orgy scene, because, <laughs> Everyone's here for me, and like no one can say anything. And I start reading it, and it's this sort of like crazy drug-fueled orgy. Um, and and I suddenly see in the audience my girlfriend's parents. Oh no! <laughs> oh my god! And I'm like just a like, oh, oh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and then I just had to keep going. That's trauma. And they're just sitting there like. <laughs> Um, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That is a good story. I like it. Yeah, and then, you know, <laughs> and then, like, the next time I had to, like, go fishing with her dad, and she's like, it's like, so urgent. Yeah, it's like, so urgent. How do you feel about urgent? Yeah. <laughs> um, but they just sort of, her parents read both my books, but just kind of pretend that they don't exist. Like, they're just like, they just pretend that this. So we can open it up to the audiences yeah. if you guys have questions. Was it a lobster fishing trip? No, that would have been. That would have been double. Yeah, terrible. if he hadn't read that, yeah, that would have been bad. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Hey. Um, when you were writing about the World Bank, yeah, yeah. Issue, were you at all concerned about the the dryness of the bureaucracy and, and Yeah, I find I, but and also writing about finance in general, it's something that there's a kind of you can't feel like you're being lectured to about the in and outs of I don't know the boringness of it. I think that's why David Foster Wallace was sort of writing about an accountant because it was just like, oh my god, this yeah. is so boring. Um, well, I love that. <coughs> yeah. Well, what? What? That was good. Came. Well, what came out of it? But I think basically you start with the character, you end with the character. You have to, and it, it has to be entirely about the character's struggle. Like you know that Kevin Forche line that's like, the good political writing erases the division between public and private discourse, and it has to feel entirely about a person struggling with a really deep personal problem. I mean, this is like a totally character-driven book, and then he happens to have a job that has some of that stuff. So I don't get into too much detail. So I find you actually don't even don't need to really understand very deeply. Often, to well, appreciate. I don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was uh, reading that Graham Greene book. Uh, what was it? Uh, the Quiet American. I just did not understand the political backdrop. I just did not get it. I just totally missed it, and yet. I loved the book and I was totally in it. I just, you don't need to understand it actually. So, yeah. I, I do worry a little bit because Paul Wolfowitz has a role in the book. He's in the book. And I'm, uh, I'm just hoping he doesn't. Assume. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So he's just a character. He yeah, he's talks. There. Yeah, he's there. And Abel Morales is too. Like, what are, like, can he see? No, uh, right? yeah, he's, he's like famous he's enough that. No, but I'm making up lies about him. Oh. Uh, yeah, it, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's borderline. Uh, he wouldn't but be able to. He has to. He'd have to prove that it's. You don't have any money. Why? Well, he wouldn't. But yeah. I did one once. I did a story with Robert McNamara as a major character. Um, and that was another one where I was like, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, and I did one with Russell Crowe actually. So I read a lot of stuff in which real people, public figures, are interacting with fictitious people in situations that blend fictitious. And in my new movies. novel, I'm writing Dirk and Wicks as a character. It's fun. Um, it's fun. But yeah. he works for Greenpeace. And Whoa. has the voice of Werner Herzog. Ooh, I love that. I can actually do a wicked Werner Herzog oh, yeah. impersonation, which I'll do after we've had some audio. audio. And I actually do a very good um, Dowager Countess, if you guys want to hear that. Um, yeah. So, is there another question? I can answer with my Dowager Countess. Um, 
For you, Peter, mm -hmm. um, I just started your book, and, and I can tell it's beautifully written, but I haven't gotten to the Bolivia part, which uh -huh. is why I picked it up, because I've lived in Bolivia oh, really? for a really cool. long time. I but you live in La Paz? No, I live there now. Actually. Oh, you live there? Now. Yeah, I'm just randomly in New York and saw cool. the um, and He's I'm, sending copies. His book is the sent. first book of his is all set in Bolivia. <laughs> and I sent them to Ava, but he never responded. Give them to Satya. But um, I've written uh, a lot over the years about Bolivia and their struggles with the world, right. and the IMF. And so I'm just wondering why Bolivia and how did you go about it? It's such a complex culture. Well, that's why I was really interested initially, because I lived in Ecuador for two years, and I basically. Ecuador is interesting, but Bolivia is slightly more interesting, and they have a lot in common. Uh, so it was easier to write about Bolivia because I knew Ecuador really well. Um, it wasn't like I had to work so hard to get to know it. So, and then the Bolivian history, the sort of El Saqueo, as you know about the sacking of. There's a way in which it perfectly encapsulates the sort of colonial, post-colonial horror show of sort of north-south relationships. Uh, they, you know, as you know, with many others probably don't, they, they say that you could build a road out of pure silver from Bolivia to Spain based on the amount of silver they pulled out of the ground in Bolivia. And it financed the Spanish Empire. It was, the, then when they found natural gas in the 90s, a Spanish company came and bought up the majority of the, it was just like the same process happening again and again. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of, the history is so remarkable. The way they lost their coastline, the, even that river in La Paz, I forget the name of it. Yeah, the, how it, it, they, they built the city around this river because it was so filled with gold. The Spanish showed up and they were like, well, that's convenient, let's just live here. Uh, and they were just grabbing it out, it was very nice for them. But then uh, the gold eventually ran out, as it will do, uh, and the city remained, and the city, the river is now underground. And it is like absurdly toxic. Like you jump into it, your skin melts off, and you're a skeleton, and then you jump out. Um, but you can't jump anymore because you're a skeleton. It's not that bad, but it's certainly super toxic. Um, and it seems like the metaphors are just already there. They're just built into the land in a way, the way it's honeycombed with these mine shafts and stuff. So that was really what drew me toward it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. And that pivot moment, 2005, when they elected their first indigenous president, a uh, country with a majority of indigenous people. And it was a really pivot point for the globe, in a way, that all of these you know, poorer countries were suddenly gaining a lot of autonomy at last, in a way that they never had before. But yeah. Are there, who has other questions? Or other questions? Everyone wants wine already. Do you have other questions? Should we ready? Going once? <laughs> Going twice? Sold to know. Thank you, guys. Thank you.